Hello, and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine, and I'm joined in studio by JJ Bull the Bullard. Hello. Hello. As we've established, if you're watching this video rather than a video podcast, good start. Good start. Mm? Basically, I can't make the mic work properly, so I have to look over here like I'm Simon Neal on Biffy Clyro and his side Yeah, for audio listeners, mic. JJ's looking away from me when he speaks, which, to, to clarify... I actually prefer. Uh, but also, ah, guten tag, Herr Staffelblor. Wie geht's du? Wie geht's is good, Herr Devine. How are you? I'm good, but I'm delighted to hear that your gates are good. Uh, because it's, it's, it's going to be a big episode today. Lots to get through. Um, as uh, people watching the video will see, I've got an iPad and a phone because I've come back from holiday and forgotten to bring my computer to work. Which is not ideal because I do need that. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're going to get through anyway. Nothing to worry about. And of course, my computer isn't required for us to discuss Newcastle and Arsenal. Uh, we can't discuss that because it's happening this evening. Maybe I do need my computer. Liverpool-Chelsea occurred. Uh, the FA Cup final. Penalties. Very exciting. Uh, we'll be talking a bit about the Bundesliga. Tottenham beating Burnley. Everton with two red cards. I missed that one, but I'm curious to hear about it. Um, and also, uh, I watched a little bit of uh, the, uh, the AC Milan game yesterday. The Scudetto. Not the Scudetto. The, uh, oh, good Lord, two weeks on holiday. (laughs) (laughs) Serie A is really heating up ahead of the final week is what I'm saying. I assume Inter Milan won their game. I don't know, but we'll find out as the podcast goes. If you want to find things out before you talk publicly about them, what you should do is visit theathletic.com forward slash TIFO. Theathletic.com forward slash TIFO. Because if you think I sound like an idiot now, you're listening to this podcast and thinking, who is this guy? How did he get there? I don't ever, ever, ever want to be like that guy. Then you should be reading The Athletic. And that's the only thing you need to do to not be as bad at this as I am. Anyway, that's theathletic.com forward slash TIFO. Uh, But for now, I will leave you in the warm hands and the cool embrace of the season's end. Liverpool nil, uh, nil Chelsea uh, 6-5 on penalties. Um, This was quite an exciting one, wasn't it, JJ? Well, I say that, I watched the last four penalties. Um, The game was quite good. I enjoyed watching it. Mm. It was a ding-dong of a battle. Uh, Tell tell me, as someone who didn't see any of it, uh, what, what was exciting about it? Uh, the football right, yeah. was good. The teams were very well matched. Liverpool went at Chelsea from the very start. Uh, Chelsea didn't look very good for this. Well, not didn't look very good, but they Liverpool looked better basically yeah. for the start of it. Yeah. And then I, I don't know exactly what changed at half time. I can't quite work out, and I know that is sort of my job <laughs> to yeah. tell you what that is. It really is. But the uh, the second half, Chelsea came out and were a lot more in the game, um, and. They've had a wobbly um, a couple of uh, weeks, Chelsea, haven't they, Seb? Um, did, you, did you notice that at all in this game? Did it feel like they were sort of playing to their capacity? No, I, I thought they played pretty well. I, I thought maybe they had a little bit of trouble for about an hour with Luis Diaz, who played ever so well. Diaz does so much. Every time he touches the ball, he seems to cram in loads of different actions on the ball before anybody else can react to them. Um, and uh, arguably one of the most unlucky FA Cup performances I've seen for a long, long time. Um, but... I think, I don't know exactly what changed, but I think that um, as the game wore on, Chelsea started to have a little bit of joy in the kind of the areas between midfield and centre-back. Also, the areas between centre-half and full-back. And you saw like players like Mason Mount getting a little bit of opportunity in there. Marcus Alonso became pretty prominent. Um, I was impressed. I, I, I know it was nil-nil, and there are a couple of people kind of slagging off this game on Twitter, but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. It was there's a real cut and thrust to it. It wasn't a stale occasion. Both teams both teams really wanted to get it done before extra time, and that always makes for a good game. I suppose there's a little bit of a subliminal commentary on um, what the FA Cup is now, uh, as a result of saying that. But it was it was fun. Um, and Diaz, I'm still at that stage. You know when a new player comes into the league and you you're kind of finding out about him a little bit and seeing what he can do and and seeing him against different opponents. I'm still at that stage with Diaz where you see you know, the full range of his abilities and just how difficult, you know, before managers have had a proper opportunity to study him on tape and stuff and they can't really game plan against him, he kind of runs right a little bit and he's, um, yeah, he's electric, great fun. It's quite interesting, isn't it, to think that maybe, you know, a year or two ago, the idea of a new wide forward coming in to improve that Liverpool attacking line just seemed yeah. like nonsense. But JJ, now it's, uh, you know, it's plain sight. He seems to have been... Promoted to basically 
top boy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Manny has moved to as a striker through the, to the center, which is seems to suit him now as well in his ripe old age of like 29, 30, whatever he is now. I remember him doing that well at Southampton. Um, yeah, well, he, he can play that role. He can play all anywhere across the front. I think he played mostly as a central striker for Senegal as well in the um, African nations. Um, I think from the very start, so it, whether by design because Chalaba was playing at right centre back or because that's where Diaz was and he's very direct and just makes things happen. Uh, from the very start, Liverpool were, I think they were sort of targeting that left side or Chelsea's right, the left side of the pitch. Mm-hmm. And um, when this, this is why I can't quite work out what was wrong with Chelsea in that first half. I think one of the, the pundits, I can't remember who it was, was saying they just couldn't decide whether they wanted to be uh, in a deep block or pressing high or even the mid. So basically, your three different versions. Chelsea didn't seem to know which one they were trying to do. Some players were trying to press high, but then the, the centre-backs were too deep, which you can't really do, leaves too much space in the middle. So they weren't compressed vertically to be able to try and push Liverpool the way they wanted to. And then Liverpool, if they did do that, pushed up high, Liverpool went over the top and that's when they're getting Diaz in behind. And then the three centre-backs looked a bit disjointed, didn't look to know quite what they were doing. Um, Kovacic, I think, got rushed back from injury to play. Uh, Jorginho was in there as well. Uh, N'Golo Kante is not really been involved of late. But I, yeah, it was... Like the second half, I think it must have just been one of those team talks where Tuchel goes through them a bit, but then also mm. tries to talk them up or something. Remember, this is a final, lads. Something like that, yeah. Passionate. Yeah. Um, I want to see more. I don't know. Not not a lot left. To, I mean, nothing really other than that left to play for in the in the season. Other, other you know, otherwise, right? What the FA Cup? They don't. They can't really win anything else now. Yeah, I'm not, just saying they're, they're essentially secured third. You would you would imagine a, a group of players reaching the end of the season. FA Cup final. I mean, Seb, is that kind of what you were referring to before? I mean, do, 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 do you think that the players presumably don't hold it in the same level of regard that they would have done 50 years ago? But it's still important you get to the end of the season, you're in the FA Cup final, particularly if your league season is, is essentially already already over. I think it's its context has changed a little bit. Like, obviously, there's no arguing that its status is diminished. But I think what it's become is this sort of forum for other rivalries. So the FA Cup, FA Cup becomes important depending on who's actually contesting the semi-final or final. So yeah. if you remember that that Liverpool Man City game that feels massive because it's those two teams playing in it on that stage. Whereas Chelsea Palace, a uh, big game, and obviously a lot of Palace fans in London uh, it, it sort of uh, come up from South London for that match, and it, it felt like a big occasion, less of a spectacle as a result of the the kind of disparity in context. I think for someone like Chelsea. Um, I suppose at the moment the league is gone, their interest in the Champions League is gone. It becomes, first and foremost, you want to win a trophy because that's the nature of modern Chelsea. Secondly, I wonder if that sort of surge of extra intensity came from the fact that some of those players won't be playing for Chelsea next season. Mm. Um, wouldn't be surprised if Marcus Alonso left, for instance. Finally, they've been trying to get rid of him seemingly for every summer for the last six or seven years, yeah. which is weird. Um Maybe not quite that long. Well, but, um, even especially because he <laughs> it seems to every new manager, I think about 30% of the way through every new manager's career at Chelsea, Marcus Alonso suddenly plays in the first team every week out of nowhere. <laughs> but you've also, you've also got quite a lot of strange stories in that. So um, I'm sure we'll talk about them later, but what's happening with Romelu Lukaku? Yeah, okay, I was so going to ask, did he get on the pitch at all, sir? Yeah, he did, but he didn't... Um, I don't know, I just it, it just never feels like it's going to work. He feels like a very disconnected piece in that Chelsea formation and he doesn't seem to... Um, I don't want to say he's unenthused by his role. It feels like he's aware that his role doesn't quite suit him at Chelsea. Uh, but then I was going to go on and, and talk about players like um, Hakim Ziyech. So what, what is Ziyech's future at Chelsea? What is Christian Pulisic's future at Chelsea? Like Pulisic had two of Chelsea's best chances, very, very nearly scored twice. And you think, okay, so this becomes a little bit about narrative, a little bit about staking your claim if you want one uh, for a, a, a punt role in the side. It's that's where its importance comes from, rather than the occasion itself. It's not yeah. a the framework is not the great event in English football. Pulisic um, also, though, I think um, um, had a c- early connection to the FA Cup, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, so Pulisic, um, when he was a very very young boy, he lived in England for a year mm. in a I think it was a small village or either a village or a small town in the north of Oxfordshire. A place where people dad, live. 
where some people live. And his dad used to take him to games all over the football pyramid. So he'd go to Premier League games. He would go to, um, you know, Football League. He even went to a couple of non-league games. So Christian Pulisic, um, I think he comes from Hershey in Pennsylvania. Um, but yeah, quite an unlikely early tie uh, to mm-hmm. the English FA Cup and the kind of the roots of English football. So it's, um, it's he became the first American to score in the FA Cup final, of course, sure. when he did that against Arsenal. So, of course. Um, he has his own history now too and nearly had a bit more. But he's a good example. You you score a winning goal in the FA Cup final when you've got nothing else to play for in a season. Changes your importance slightly at a club, makes it a little bit harder to sell you or a little bit, you you know, increase your claim for a yeah. a place above somebody else. But that's that's the narrative stuff, isn't it, I suppose? Well, um, on the narrative stuff, Ziyech, yeah. uh, I heard someone saying, so, incidentally, someone who does not know any of the inside of this at all. This is just a, a kind of um, merely a stylistic suggestion uh, that maybe Ten Hag would be interested in Ziyech at uh, Manchester United because, of course, he played under him at Ajax and was uh, was successful there. Seems to be a bit of a, um, I don't know, I mean, a bit of a... He's, he's, he's not a starter at Chelsea, let's put it that way. But he would cost far too much from Chelsea to sell it to a rival like United. It would be far. Do you think? It would cost, yeah, they'd be able to ask for 50 million because it's United and because it's a rival. They do keep selling it. players to United that they don't Ten Hag might try and take Anthony from Ajax. Just sure. a similar-ish sort of player, like right-sided, left-footer. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be more likely to come over. I thought, um, just talking about Pulisic and Lukaku there, this this game was another gr- perfect example for me of what Pulisic is good at and what he's also bad at. Like, like technically, great player, athletically, great player, really quick, nimble, well-balanced, good feet, um, can dribble past people and occasionally gets the ball in a really tight little bit of space and runs through players and creates something. That's what you can do. But there's also, I think there's two, I remember one particular, I think there was two um, opportunities in this game where he didn't play the pass when he needed to and took a beat, which is where the chance goes. And at that level, I think it was Lukaku was making the run just off the, the shoulder of the, the last man just trying to get in behind. And he's done this throughout the season, Pulisic, not made that ball when he needs to. Yeah. Either because he can't see it or doesn't think he can execute it. But he's, that's he's quite a good nearly guy, isn't he? Yeah, he's just. He, he's, I think he'll never be in that top tier because he just doesn't have the. I don't know the killer instinct or something like that that's in him. Whereas Lukaku, uh, he got in the pitch because he started the game, so he was there from the very kickoff and was, I think, useless for the first half, particularly. Mm. Pretty much standing still does, but he's done for a lot of the games that when he has played, where he just stands up top near defenders, walks around a bit, um, doesn't, the ball bounces off him, he doesn't control it when it comes across him, doesn't get involved. Second half, he seemed to do more. He just seemed to do more. Mm. Buzzing about a bit. Wasn't dropping deep, still plays off the last man, um, like a goal poacher does. Trying to, They're not going to be able to break against Liverpool as much as they want to. It might be quite annoying to be Lukaku though. Because you've been, you know, you're a star signing, yeah. you're extremely expensive, you've come back to a club that you played at previously, Um You've been signed by one manager and then, you know, inherited by another very quickly afterwards whose style, it, it would appear, I don't really know the ins and outs of it, like doesn't quite suit what he wants to, you know, how he plays best. And it's only been one season, right? It, yeah. I mean, you must feel extremely dejected. I I'm not, wouldn't be that surprised. This isn't, a, a, you know, um, not questioning his, his character or desire either, but it's just a natural human response to, you know, reach the end of a disappointing season and then like well, hurt have 45 minutes where... Yeah, I mean, kind of what's the point? If you're a player pleasing in confidence, like Lukaku seems to, and a, a goal scorer will always be better when they're confident, that just mm. makes sense. Uh, if you're not getting the support you want from your manager because he's not really seeing you as the player that you think you are, like all the things you read about Lukaku is that he's a very confident man. He really very much believes he is one of the best players in the world, um, which is what you need to have, that sort of mentality to be able to play at the level he plays at. Uh but he doesn't seem to quite suit um, what Chelsea want to do with him. But also, I mean, regardless of how you think he plays, he's not a target man. We've discussed this many times. I think he's more of a poacher. Yeah. Some people call him a counter-attack player. I don't think it's even that. He's just like a goal poacher. He's like Michael Owen was or something. I was looking at... So I'm doing a thing on Tammy Abraham coming up. And uh, I was looking at how he played for Chelsea under Lampard then Tuchel. Uh, very similar to Lukaku in that he wants to play off the last man, plays up front, looks kind of separated from the team an awful lot of the time because he's uh, trying to play within the width of the six-yard box, which is another thing you might be taught. So if you've been taught your whole life to play in the six-yard box and then you're very good at that and are getting the goals, which Lukaku did, mm-hmm. um, although actually, when you think about it, he's playing Inter Milan, he's part of a two, and he's also playing in mostly in the half spaces rather than sure. the width of the box. And Lukaku's confusing like that is that 
maybe he wants to be able to arrive in the box to be able to finish off things rather than just being there. Whereas if you're the main striker as a nine in that system, you need to be in the middle and be able to control the ball. Like yeah. he's a good, he's a very good player, Lukaku. You should be able, there's a ball that came across him from wide and he just stuck his leg out n- to not control it. I don't understand what he was trying to do. He should be able to control a simple ball across the box. Yeah. But it, the, the less involved he is with the game, to, to me, it looks like the <laughs> worst his touch gets. Like, again, he's a top European player. Mm. Uh, the ball comes. I think if he was involved more in the in the play, he'd be able to do things and would trust his touch more to be able to hit the ball down. Mm-hmm. And that's a classic thing that people have said about him in the past: is that his first, like the first touch, bounces off his foot an awful lot. That only seems to happen when he's not involved in play an awful lot. But in a team like Chelsea, who have all the ball, and he's then separated from the team, trying to create space for other people. I think that's where that happens. I don't know. There's a lot it's of stuff. Also, I mean, work. it's I don't know. We, we can move on from him, but I mean, yeah, I, sure. I, having watched him, I think the thing he does consistently best is running behind, run onto the ball rather than receiving the ball. I think but that's he's always really been his quick. Skill. He's super um, fast. Yeah. Anyway, we'll see what happens with him over the summer. Whether he uh, whether he stays at Chelsea or, or moves on, I think that's going to be an interesting do you, story. Do you, do you think if he had a different shaped body, he would be viewed differently? It seems one of those instances. Jane, sure. JJ mentioned Michael Owen there. And I agree, like, I, I see some of the kind of the predatory instincts in Lukaku's game and the subtleties and the craft and his finishing and actually some of his creative play. I know in the beginning of his career wasn't great, but it really improved and developed. If you give him a slightly different body, you don't, um, you don't sort of tempt people with that perception of a target yeah. man because he's not a target man. No. He is a, um, a really, really skilled finisher. And yet because um, he's physically so impressive i think that becomes a distraction from all his technical abilities yeah. whereas if you were to to do i don't know um to to make him kind of uh if, if he looked like samuel eto for instance you'd think oh just goal scorer you sure. know just like you know you know craft and, and go well, I, I also think it's um, fair to say that people will misunderstand um regularly what like physicality in forwards actually means and what, what its application is like a target man sure like if we're talking about an, an aerial player where the ball is lobbed up to someone and they're able to reach it ahead of defenders and knock it knock it onto the path for a coming player i can understand why height is important but in terms of what lukaku does best running past players running off the shoulder he uses his physicality to push defenders out of the way but a technical player can do that with speed and guile he's able to hold the ball up well because of it because of his strength and because he's technically proficient but also a, a smaller more technical player can do that with technique and guile like i think all of the things that he does um, are exactly the same as like what an Aguero would do, for example. Like the, the he he, it's because he's a little bit taller. People think, well, he must be good in the air, right? Like that's yeah. the only distinction. He's also not very aggressive with his like. He's a big lad, but he doesn't u- really use that aggressively. I think similar to almost the like Erling Holland uh, going to City, uh, big guy, total machine when he plays. When he gets running, like he's suited playing at Dortmund when he can get in behind. Mm-hmm. But like Lukaku, other clubs like Inter Milan. But I don't think Holland is particularly aggressive either. So he doesn't attack headers in the box, really. It's okay. one of the things I remember about him. I don't think, I can't remember really seeing Lukaku attack headers, things like that. Because he attacks the ball. Yeah, attacks <laughs> I the mean, ball. like when he hits the, when he, when he shoots, even with, you know, even, even with his left, right, uh, those odd angles, like he can get power behind the ball. That's, yeah. that's like, that's the thing. Other but, last but how often, well, how often have you actually seen him finish with power? Because obviously like, mm-hmm. um, you have that kind of prejudice, which labels, um, black centre forwards particularly as being pace and power and that's it and there's no you know all that stuff that mm-hmm. goes on I can't remember many Romelu Lukaku finishes which are actually just foot through the ball try and break the net I can um, remember like a lot said, of like just past the post shots where he does that well, past the post, but there's there's a, there's like this sort of um, he, he's a good finisher on the side foot he is a good header of the ball mm. um, like he there's a subtlety to his finishing whereas he's often portrayed as this kind of blunt object which is just going to batter you that's just not who he is at all. Like that's never been the way he played, whether it was a West Brom or Everton or, you know, the first brief sort of moments at Chelsea or Man United, Inter Milan. One other thing about Inter Milan, Lukaku, that Except, thing with uh, his touch, I Rose feel like Lukaku's screen, yeah. of all the players, all his contemporaries. I'm is just going to talk sensitive. over you, Seb, because you've frozen there. But um, I was very interested in what you were saying. I'm glad that the computer screen froze. No, not really. Uh, but we do need to move on because we've spent, I don't know, a really, really long time just talking about that. Uh, a quick uh, ch- talk about uh, Liverpool still have the opportunity to do a, a quadruple. Um, I mean, they've won the League Cup already. They've now won the FA Cup. It's quite difficult to see them winning the Premier League, but they could win the Champions League, JJ. Yes, I think they probably will. 
Yeah. Although a treble, a cup treble in this FA Cup final, I think Van Dijk went off with a little bit of an injury. Salah maybe went off with a bit oh, of an injury. Did they really? Mm, Fabinho might not be fit in time. Very important players. Oh dear. Yes. Yes. Okay. Fine. Well, uh, you know, I guess that's partly what happens when we get to extra time at the end of the season. Fine. Uh, congratulations to Liverpool on winning the FA Cup. Uh, we'll be back after the short break. The break is over. Um, not in the plan as far as I can see, but uh, West Ham and Man City drew. Did either of you catch that game? Yeah. Oh, both of you did. It was good. And yet it's not in the plan. It's very interesting, isn't it? Well, Seb did that this morning. Very interesting, Seb. Let's throw Seb under the bus. Come then. on, Seb. Tell us about the game. Because they, d- I mean, even though it seems like a fumble, it's not really, is it? Not really. Um, obviously, we were talking on WhatsApp about this, Joe, and, and Man City have such a favourable goal difference that doesn't really matter um, yeah. the pressure isn't as such that it, that it might have been they kind of built um, that goal difference up by the way over the last month didn't they by beating everyone yeah. 6-0 <laughs> they have been relentless over the last couple of months over the last month particularly um, two things I take away from this game uh, how good a finisher is Jared Bowen on form really um, the two goals he took I had a couple of people say that uh, oh you know he's sort of very very instinctive in that area now if he is then I've missed it because I don't I don't have that kind of trust you know when some players run through on goal you have that instinct which is either goal not goal straight at the goalkeeper straight over the top straight in the stand that kind of stuff um, but two really really nice finishes uh, the second thing is um, that's as good a penalty save from Lucas Fabianski as I've seen in a really really long time mm. it's a really good save um, and actually. Um, one final thing. Well done to West Ham for the way they handled the Mark Noble thing. I don't think um, I don't think there's quite enough of that in the game. And everything I saw associated with it was very touching and very affecting. And a guy that's given his his career to one club. Sure. Um, and there's if you can still find it, there's a, a video of him coming out at the end of the game um, with what I imagine are his, his children um, to kind of take the applause of the crowd. And you're looking. I'm stranded. just thinking. I they probably were, unless they were just like random. Well, they kids. might have been nieces and nephews. That's <laughs> oh, all. okay. Other yeah. family members. Other family sure, members. Yeah. And it was very nice, and it was very well done. And and um, and I just think sometimes we some of that stuff gets lost under the mountain of kind of what have you won, snark, or sure. how many England caps have you got? And yeah, Mark Mark Noble's um, uh, not England career is at another topic, but um, sure doesn't diminish from the things that he's given to West Ham, I don't think. No, it absolutely doesn't. Well done for a long and successful career of Mark Noble. Can I also say, though, I can imagine him becoming, like, um, the assistant manager of uh, Scott Parker. You know, could you see it? The two of them together? He wouldn't be Scott Parker. He would go with um, someone who needs... Be another Kevin Nolan. Uh, sure, he'll, he'll end up being the assistant to someone who's more, f- like... Um, you think of them as being more forward thinking and, and oh, brand new and he right. brings the uh, the real you know, he understands the players. Like you know, the clock might like. hire him next year. Like not that, but no. something more David we'll, Moyes. Mm, no, he's too already he, he could converse with people who are of It was just a joke. You know, there's supposed to be someone though. Just like the idea of I always I always sort of thought of those two players as similar sorts of players. Sort of if like Gianfranco Zola went back to West Ham, right. that's when Martin Noble would go in as assistant. Right. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Or uh, yeah. uh, who's another player that might do it? Well, I saw um, uh, Declan Rice tweeting about uh, what trans- transpired to be Mark Noble in the end, but he just called him Mr. West Ham at the beginning. And when I read his tweet, I thought, this is like a really weird, like I'm leaving the club tweet or something. Thanks, Mr. West Ham, for all the good times we've shared together. I thought, Mr. West, are you leaving? Oh, Mr. West Ham. Anyway, there we go. Uh, but that's all fine and dandy. Man City will probably still win the, the Premier League. Uh, it's tight though. Do you know they play Aston Villa as their last game? Yeah. So although Steven Gerrard is employed by Aston Villa, I mean, I think everyone knows he basically <laughs> works for Liverpool. Right. <laughs> that's basically what he does, right? I mean, so, not technically. But I mean, yeah. not technically. I mean, or literally. He what do you is, mean? In any, how does he do that in any way? Because he is Liverpool. He loves Liverpool. Right. That's the thing. But he works for them now. Well, what no. are you suggesting, like as a sort of spy, or <laughs> Do you know? I mean, you he's know, out there to sabotage Villa so that he, Liverpool can definitely win the quadruple. He will be so desperate to beat Man City just to try right. and give Liverpool That's a chance to win. Yes. Oh, okay. So you're I, saying he supports Liverpool? I'm sure rather he than is. He basically works for them. 
<laughs> yeah. Because, you know. But I, what I mean is going to... I shop at, you know, do Tesco so much all research. the time. I basically work at Tesco. <laughs> he will be do so much research for this Aston Villa uh, Man City game to try and give Liverpool... I mm. bet that's what you'd be doing. He'll I guess the downside is every weakness he, he is the manager of Aston Villa and he will be playing Man City. So yeah. I, my prediction is that Man City will win the game. But I could be wrong. And I know you love the stories, the He'll exciting stories. He'll get them stories. fired up. They'll be, they'll be, uh, you'll be getting to them all week. Fine, fine. Let's take a sojourn now to the Bundesliga, Seb, where things really have happened. Things really, really did happen. So on Saturday, Stuttgart saved themselves from the relegation playoff with a 91st minute goal. Oh, it's great fun. That's and nice. That, who, yeah, who was the was. scorer of the goal? Endo scored, so it was it was from a corner where um, to endo their up, fears the of box. relegation. Is that right? He did, in fact, endo their fears. Well, not yeah. quite because they needed Borussia Dortmund to beat Hertha Berlin. Oh, um, and but uh, Dortmund were holding on at the time, and uh, the game struck had finished a little bit before. Um, so they had that kind of little moment on the pitch where all the players are waiting and the crowd is, is trying to listen to radios and phone people. And I stuff always and remember no Phil 4G. Jones just like looking around wildly. On Old, yeah. Old Trafford when they're waiting for the for the Aguero moment, and I keep I always think when I see that, what's he looking for? <laughs> it's yeah. not happening here, you know. Just looking away, uh, you know. Anyway, never mind. That's fine. That's an inside. Thing. Anyway, inside so head. Stuttgart survive, and if you can find any of the pictures of the celebration afterwards, you had that the sort of the classic fans on the top of the netting and the mascot, the, the Stuttgart mascot, it's this kind of dinosaur type thing, right in there as well, celebrating in his little suit. Um, nice, probably sweating terribly. Uh, and that was great. Uh, on Sunday, uh, it was the final day of the Zweite Bundesliga, and we knew That's Schalke the Bundesliga were up. too, right? It is indeed. Mm. It is indeed. We knew Schalke were up, uh, but they confirmed themselves as champions. Second automatic playoff spot went to Werder Bremen, and the only remaining issue was um, who was going to get the uh, spot to face Hertha Berlin in the promotion relegation playoff. And um, despite going goal down, Hamburg came back to win three two. Um, to beat Hansa Rostock and edge out Darmstadt on goal difference. Really tough. Darmstadt have had a really great season. They, they're kind of um, they're one of the unfancied teams. They were sort of, I suppose, uh, probably this season's Holsten Kiel. Um, uh-huh. uh, they came ever so close and it was very unlucky. And Hartsvall have many more resources than they do. But so that's going to be um, that's going to be a massive game. So, so Hamburg. So Ham- Hamburg are in the promotion relegation playoff, and you yeah, live in the city of Hamburg. I sure do. And will you be attending the game? Uh, efforting, efforting. Don't know yet. You'll be efforting um, to attend the game. Efforting to attend the game. Well, I hope yes, you do. If you do, will you take a picture of yourself uh, in a, you know, I don't know. Probably take more than one, but yeah. yeah. I shall take some pictures. Fine. I shall create evidence of me having been there, yes. Okay. By the way, I don't know if listeners are interested in the private life of Seb Stafford Bloor, but he does have a TikTok account where he posts videos of his cats. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's quite nice to see them. What's your TikTok name, Seb? <laughs> I don't know. I've actually I've, I've deleted it from my phone. No. I don't really like TikTok. Yeah, I don't, oh. I don't like it. Okay, no, well, so the, the like videos I, of your cats are still there, so you yeah, know they, they can they can stay there. That's fun okay. for all. Well done, the Bundesliga and the Spider Bundesliga. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. We'll hear more from Seb about the plight, the plight, the challenge, the excitement of Hamburg uh, as plight the days right, go on. I reckon probably plight, plight would, but who could be, say? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fine. Uh, Tottenham won nil Burnley. I'll probably stay with you, Seb, for this as a uh, as a as a as a Toto yourself. Um, that's what they call them, isn't it? That is, uh, that is, yeah. Little yeah, troubling. Little troubling for Burnley. The relegation battle, of course, is um, it's quite confusing. Yeah, well, it became more so because Leeds snatched a point later in the day. So Leeds got a, a late equaliser against uh, Brighton. It, it, but, an extremely um, necessary uh, point. Extremely necessary equaliser, yes, indeed. Uh, Burnley played pretty well. Um, there's a little bit of um, sourness about the penalty, and I get it, but it's the rule, and it's annoying and frustrating, but um, unless you change the rule, you can't defend like this in your box and get hit on the arm and expect not okay. to give away a penalty. Okay, it's, great, great. Hold on, let's just... just uh, Podcasting 101 there. Great stuff. A game, yeah. no one will have seen the game, Seb. So describe the incident. And also, when you but, pulled your arm out like that, half the people can't see <laughs> I can't see But the game was very, very, very much on television. I know, but no one watched that one. Come on, did you watch that one, JJ? Um, I did because I'm so oh. committed to providing an excellent podcast for our Craig, viewers. did you watch it? No, Craig says he didn't watch it. And Craig but, but is Craig the audience. Football, well, yeah. 
you know. uh, but can you I, I basically what I'm saying is I'm upset because I, I feel excluded from the conversation I don't understand okay. what okay, happened fine. will you tell me what it was and why you put your arm out in that aggressive way right well it was an aggressive it was it was more performative than aggressive but okay um, so very late in the first half uh, nil nil uh, Davinson, Davinson Sanchez has a little bit of a hack at goal from a uh, from a corner oh. And there. Ashley Barnes, who's defending, uh, defending. He's defending. He was defending. Oh, he was defending in close proximity. Uh, tries to close him down, but uh, with this sort of body motion, has one of his arms out. The ball, Up in the, air. Um, the ball hacks off. So uh, he, he 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 stands like the angel of the north. Is that what you're saying? A little bit. Yeah. But if if the angel of the north only had one arm, oh out, okay, the other one sure. wasn't. It was just this arm. Yeah. Sanchez his makes right a little bit of a uh, loose contact. What angle would you Ball. say his arm was at for listeners? Just I would say it was probably <laughs> just above 90 degrees. Just above? Yeah, just above. And, that, and you're starting about... 90 from the waist, not the side of the head? No, 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 no. Starting, I'm starting zero. 90, I'm starting 90 from the floor. So yeah, 90 yeah, degrees yeah. and a little bit more. And So okay. you're sort of, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, ball hits him on the hand, penalty, goal, hurricane, sour grapes, conspiracy, the game is unfair, etc., etc., etc. But also, Nick Pope played very, very well. So um, that was an, an interesting little bit that I was going to put on the, on the podcast, which I don't think we're going to get to. Sorry. Let me just tell you about the relegation battle happening at the bottom of this. Oh, it was very exciting. Three teams, of course, down there. Burnley with a game in hand on uh, Leeds, it should be said. Two games to play for Burnley. Um, currently, as we speak, they're on 34 points. Leeds, one game more played than Burnley. 30, 35 points. Mm, yes. And Everton, of course, uh, also a game in hand on Leeds, 36 points. Um, hard to know, really, if, if Everton have sort of... Uh, I mean, they're not completely safe, are they? But you would assume that they probably are OK. I mean, who have Burnley got left to play? Let's have a look at the fixtures. This is exciting, isn't it? OK, so they play Aston Villa in three days' time, away from home, and then they're at home to Newcastle. Everton's two remaining fixtures of the season are at uh, home to Crystal Palace in three days' time and are also uh, away to Arsenal. So that is quite a bit of a toughie for the Arsenal still chasing top four, potentially, come the end of the season. Um, Leeds' final game away to Brentford, who had a nice game over the weekend also. So it's too too close to call, isn't it, JJ? Yes, Yes, it is. Yes. We can talk about Brentford Everton if you want. Do you want to do that? Yeah. Let me just see if that's next. Oh, it is next. It is next. Everton 2, uh, 3, Brentford. Two red cards in this game. And uh, Seb's note here, I believe it's Seb's note, a thousand percent of red card. I don't know which one he's referring to. Oh, Jared Branthwaite. Oh. What, what was it? Well, I haven't seen the highlights. What happened. I don't know if it's a thousand percent. So, I mean, everyone says it's a... So, right, so for context, what what this is is that um, Everton are attacking. At, at what angle is your arm at, though, just to help understand? It's two hundred and seventy degrees. Yeah, fine. Uh, spinning, mm -hmm. rotating. Yeah, so that is about one thousand and eighty degrees. Sure. Yeah. Ten. It's just spinning, just non -stop, twirling, like a propeller, twirling. Yeah. Ever more. Mm -hmm. uh, Everton are attacking. The ball, the ball is put into the box. Christopher Iyer is trying to take off Richarlison's shirt by pulling it a lot, yeah. but not enough. I don't even know if it's a penalty. I don't. I can see why it's not. Right? Everton are annoyed. They think they should have a penalty for this bit here, but the ball then bounces through. It gets hoofed uh, well over the back of the Everton back line. Um, um, a striker comes through. I can't remember the name. Is forgotten. I've got Natoni. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and Tony is running through, and Branthwaite is chasing. Comes across in you know that thing where they're just both chasing the same ball and they're really mm. close together. Can't mm -hmm. quite get out of his way, and yeah. then the legs tangle and he goes down. Right. So sounds like a thousand percent. Yeah, it's. I mean, the thing is, he's not meant to take him down. <laughs> so no. I, I know that's a that's a foul because you. St I'd be really annoyed if it was me running through and goal, but like he's taking me out. But he didn't mean that. It's just legs have been caught. And intention not really it. required, though. Is I it? know it's. I can see exactly. So what, right I guess your point is that when you say when someone says a thousand percent, you feel that if it's over a hundred percent, it needs a little intention. Um, yeah, I think if he'd come and chopped him, like you know that there's a tackle that Thiago did in the FA Cup final where he launched yeah. with two feet into like a a proper like power lunge. Sure. Uh, just about got all the ball, landed over the top of it. If that had been another player, he'd probably been in a lot of trouble. But because mm. Thiago is just not like that. Sure. 
you know, you, you can sort of go, well, he was just doing a thing to be, right. this has been Tiago. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, this guy gets sent off okay. for that. And it kind of ruined Everton's entire game. So down to 10 men, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the second one was, what was the second? It's a straight red, wasn't it? It's the Rondon one. Oh, yeah. It's very, very like the Luke Ayling tackle that um, he, happened he, during the Leeds-Arsenal game a couple of weeks ago. He'd only been on for just, four minutes, is that right? He was angry. If that, if that, he just launches himself both feet off the ground. And it's a, he, he knows, he knows kind of mid-air that what is happening right. is about to lead to him getting sent off. It's just, um, I don't think it was malicious i think it was born from just ultra enthusiasm but it was misplaced probably frustration as well the season so yeah you know if um okay. if everton needs something at arsenal um and they're playing crystal palace then they won't have a uh, a second forward to back fine. up an unfit dominic calvert alone fine fine um christian erickson seb mm. these are my stats oh christian erickson jj yes so since he's rejoined Football, yes, and the world, I suppose, basically. Yes. Um, he joined Brentford and played his first game, I think it's 26th of February. So I went and looked through Opta data uh-huh. to see if he's been good since then, according to data, because we can see with the eyes that he's been quite useful. We can see that with the eyes. Yeah. Yeah. What does the data tell us? Well, it tells us that he has created 15 chances from set plays since he's been coming back. So he's played, I think it's 10 games he's played. Is that good? Uh, yes. It sounds good. Only James Ward-Prowse has created more since that same time period, oh, okay. since February 26, 16. Right. He's James also Ward-Prowse, played, who was nominated for Player of the Year. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He, has been, he is very good, James okay. Ward-Prowse. Yeah. Then also, Christian Eriksen has played the most passes into the box in total. Um, what, of anyone? Ward- of anyone in the league since he's come back. So the most passes into Brentford. the box. That could be crosses, yeah, at Brentford. As a midfielder there, playing a slightly deeper role, maybe he has before. Um, Ward Prowse is second, to put it stylistically where they are. That includes set plays. That makes a lot of sense because that will include crosses into the box. That's kind of makes sense. But what I really liked was this stat. Only one player has played more passes into the final third um, than Ericsson's 125. So playing passes into the final third could be from anywhere on the pitch. James Ward Prowse? No, he played in this game in the Everton game. So one player in the league has made more passes into the final third, a lot more passes. Ericsson's made 125. This guy's made 165. Uh, you'll never guess it. I'll just tell you who it is. It's so, quite funny. No, it's Jordan Pickford. <laughs> uh, I guess that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> that is an indication of tactical yeah. choice from old Frankie boy. Really Everton. Is. Pickford's just hoofing it, like launching the thing. Yeah. And the ball's getting... I guess it has to be a completed pass. So then that means that Calvert-Lewin or someone up front, Charleston's taking that ball down. Yeah, okay. Useful asset to have. Useful asset to have. But Christian Eriksen, yes. Well done to you. He's playing very well. Well, that's nice. There's been lots of rumours about him potentially moving to a different club. Yes. Uh, so I'll be curious to see again what happens with him in the summer. And of course, if those of you listening to the podcast are wondering what will be happening with the TFO podcast over the summer, uh, nothing. We'll just carry on and uh, we'll work out what it is that we talk about as and when we get there. But Sensible Transfers will be returning with a few delicate little sparkles here and there uh, so uh, look out for that we'll cover that in audio form as well as video and uh, we'll cover all of the uh, interesting things basically uh, you know imagine you're uh, all of good stuff's a piece of toast but it's dry and you need to spread that peanut butter you spread it all the way across the toast and that's tifo um probably spread a little thin anyway uh the seria oh we need another break let's have a break ah Yes, Serie A uh, is going down to the final day. Very exciting. Um, I watched some of the, or most of the uh, AC Milan uh, Atalanta game yesterday, which was uh, nice. Rafael uh, Leao with another lovely goal. And also um, Teo Hernandez with a, a, what do they call it, a slaloming run. He picked the ball up in his own half and get this, scored a goal after running the whole way across the pitch. It was very nice. um, And uh, I enjoyed to watch it. Um, at that point, uh, Inter were going to play their game uh, just after this one. Uh, but at that point, before Inter played, AC Milan had opened a five-point gap, which is quite frightening when there's only one game left to go in the league. Inter, of course, did beat Cagliari. Uh, it's 1-3 there. Um, and there's two points in it for the final weekend of the season. It's very exciting. We don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you that Inter play Sampdoria. Uh, next weekend and Milan's uh, final game is against well they're away at Sassuolo which is actually quite a difficult 
difficult opposition to play. Um, Milan definitely had the harder of the two final fixtures, but 2-0 uh, away at Atalanta. It's going to be exciting. I don't know how long it's been, Seb, since uh, Milan have won uh, Serie A, but it's been a long time. They also, um, yeah. they don't have like the best squad in the league, but maybe they have the best team. I think they won the Serie A lost in 2009 or 2010, something like that. Hey, Joe, you know what else is really interesting about Serie A? Mm. Salernitana. So um, because Inter Milan beat Cagliari 2-1, um, Salernitana are set to perform one of the, the greatest escapes from, from relegation. A couple of months ago, they were rock bottom and they've been on a ridiculous run. And um, I think heading into the final day, they're two points clear of Cagliari. So I don't well, know what the goal difference looks like, yeah. but um, they are very, very nearly there. Would um, would you just would that be like comparable to Norwich escaping? Um, I, I would say it's comparable to Norwich escaping from the situation they were in this season. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know about the size of clubs. I don't know enough about Salernitana. Oh no, I just mean yeah, the situation be, in terms of the the gap between them. And I think the rest most of the people league. have written them off. Yeah, um, well. but it's been amazing, and they knocked off some really, really good teams along the way. Very exciting, um, and they've got Frank Ribery in there, who's must be about fifty five by now. Um, but it's um, it's really interesting. It's a great story. Okay, cool. Uh, well, Napoli and Ju Juventus uh, will be finishing in, in, in third and fourth uh, positions as well. Lazio and uh, Roma just missing out. Roma, of course, an interesting story because uh, Mourinho's first season in charge and maybe we will uh, grab uh, Monsieur Horncastle and discuss that with him at some point over, over the summer because I'm curious to hear what's happened there. Tammy Abraham having a fantastic season as well. But we'll cover all of these things as and when the future dictates. Um, I think that's basically the end of the, the podcast for today, unless anyone else has anything they'd like to mention. Andy Considine, uh, beloved at Aberdeen, doesn't play there anymore. There's some sort of controversy around his leaving, didn't want to leave, won't go into all the details because unless you're really wrapped up in it, it's not right. hugely interesting to everyone else. But um, it's a, sh a shame that he has had to leave the club when he doesn't want to. Uh, but I believe there are many details behind the scenes. I'm not sure what's on or not off record, <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about it. Can on I podcast. say it's a shame because he's been a, a constant a joy to watch? Yes. But yeah, love you, Andy Constein. Yes. Fine, fine. That's all I have for you. Well, before we go, I told you I was on holiday and I uh, just figured I'd um, just let you know about the things I watched when I was on holiday. Yeah? Would you both like to know about that? Yeah? Yeah. Jackass. <laughs> That's good, though. The movie or just the, the TV show? Jackass 3.5. <clears throat> um, Hercules 2014. That had Ian McShane in it with uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Is that Hercules if he was in the year 2014 or you seen the year it came out? It's the, the year the film came out, although that would be a good idea if to pitch to a Hollywood studio. Hercules Now. Not now, but just in 2014. What would it be, Hercules Now? What was the original... What was the well, I get what, what you would... I mean, I suppose the story of Hercules, you know, uh, uh, part man, part god, mm. demigod, as they would call him, overcoming various uh, mythical beasts and objects on his path to greatness. I suppose the modern Hercules would be I would have to like take down the global financial institutions <laughs> and then like take out ISIS or something, you know, that's what he would do. You wouldn't call him Hercules, but then it would be Hercules. Yeah. This is, uh, I wrote this down because um, this is one of the, my favorite um, ending lines to any film. And Ian McShane says it, so you know it's going to be good. Ian McShane says, You don't need to be a demigod to be a hero, you just need to believe you're a hero. Which is like one of the most mental things I've ever <laughs> That's not how it works. That doesn't work like that. That means what well, anyone could just believe they're a hero. Isn't that how you create people who do like unspeakable acts in the name of heroism because they've convinced themselves? Anyway, I think there's a very unethical ending to the um, Hercules. Um, there's those lads who go around America as well, dressed up as superheroes. Those ones. Yeah. Yeah, Try well, there's those. Vigilantes. I watched She's All That. Mm -hmm. That was good. And uh, also, oh, weird about She's All That. We're wrapping up. She's All That. Um, <laughs> I, I, I haven't seen it for 20 years or something, right? Did it? So I, I, I didn't realise until I rewatched it now that the, the song they play at, at prom when everyone does a big dance is a Fat Boy Slim song. <laughs> and I had no idea that Fat Boy Slim had sort of, you know progressed to featuring in major 
major American, uh, uh, you know, teen films for it. Anyway, there we go. Also watch The Iron Lady um, with Old Street doing Thatcher. Street's great. That would be good if it was the 2014 bit, update you know? version where she is an Iron Lady. Sure. She comes back as yeah. like Robo Thatcher. Yeah. Uh, one you know genuine what? recommendation, Smashes though. Smashes the place up. Uh, Outer Range. I enjoyed Outer Range, available on uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, Josh Brolin as a kind of sexy uh, sci fi cowboy. This is. What else could you possibly want? <laughs> And if you like actress, sexy yeah. sci-fi space cowboys, you should visit the Athletic. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Well, that's the end of uh, Joe's holiday uh, uh, screen recommendations. Um, JJ Bull the Bullard, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. You can look forward to the rest of your meetings today without the computer. Yes, thank yeah. you. And uh, <laughs> ah, Serb Stafford Bloor, Danke schön and auf Wiedersehen, der boy. Vielen Dank, Herr Dabei. That's right. Keep those gates good. Uh, we'll be back next week with more of the same. Thank you to producer Craig and to whoever has edited the audio today. Much appreciated. Um, take care. Bye.